Uh, I'm very fortunate today to have with us a team from Ernst & Young, uh, Dana Krieg and Tanner Coulter. Coulter, that's what I get for not following my script. <laughs> and uh, I know what they're going to share with you today is going to be very helpful and insightful. Uh, I've seen this presentation before. Um, with the ACA becoming law, uh, you know, we see new terminology surrounding counting employees, variable hour, and payroll accountability. And today we're here to provide you with insight into these new requirements and how your business needs to prepare for and implement them. So as I said, we have Tanner Coulter on my right, far right, who's manager of Human Capital, uh, and Dana Krieg, executive director of Human Capital, which is an interesting title. But uh, uh, Tanner is a member of Ernst & Young uh, uh, Human Capital pra Practice in the Dallas office, they're both in Dallas. Tan is primarily focused on uh, tax aspects of certain compensation and benefits matters. Uh, Tan is a graduate of the Indiana University Morris School of Law and received his undergraduate degree from DePoy University. In addition, Tan is a member of the American Bar Association and the Indiana State Bar Association. With Tan, as I said, is Dana, who's executive director uh, with Ernst & Young Practice in Dallas. Our primary focus is executive compensation. Um, and related projects such as short and long-term incentive plans. In addition, Dana has focused a significant amount of time over the past year educating employers on the impact of the Affordable Care Act. Dana has worked with clients in a variety of industries, including oil and gas, utilities, mining, retail, nonprofit manufacturing, and healthcare. So we have a lot of experience here, a lot of knowledge. I know that uh, both Dana and Tanner said that as they go through their presentation, if you have questions, shout them out. Let's talk about it when it happens. We'll also leave a few minutes at the end if uh, you have some additional questions you want to wrap up with. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dana and Tana. Great. Well, thanks for, um, thanks for coming today out in the rain and everything. Um, we're excited to be here and have the opportunity to speak to you guys. I think um, from the ACA presentations I've heard and, and uh, the the things that we've done, I think we take a little bit different perspective on ACA than a traditional HR consulting firm would or a law firm. Um, what we've done is we have a group in DC, our EY uh, Washington Council, and they've been tracking um, the Affordable Care Act since 2010 when it was, um, when it was uh, implemented or passed. And so really they've been, they've been focused on not necessarily what do you need to do to your benefits plans to be compliant with this, but as an organization, what do you need to do to operationalize this? This is a huge change. Um, and it's so much more than, you know, I need to cover dependent stage 26 now and I need to eliminate lifetime maximums and pre-existing conditions. It really is an organizational wide effort. Um, and so what we did is we, we looked at it as a tax law because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, so we have our tax attorney here who can, <laughs> who can, who can talk about that. But it, it's, you know, it impacts IT, it impacts finance, it impacts HR, it impacts internal audit to, to an extent. Um, it, it really is far reaching in its implications. It's not just simply an HR issue and it's not just simply let me change my benefits plans to be compliant. Um, hold on one second. Um, so really um, what we are doing is, is going out to employers. Um, we had a huge effort in January where, as Glenn said, I'm an executive comp person by background, but this is such a far-reaching effort that we actually had a, a huge training back at the first of the year when you know everybody agreed that, okay, this is gonna be a reality now. This isn't gonna change. And they really just trained all of us up, got us all up to speed on ACA and said, you know, Go out let's go out and help clients because this this is a lot bigger than I think most people realize um, of course at the first of January uh, first of July um, you know they did have the delay so really the only thing that that's changing is that the penalties aren't are going to be delayed a year um, you everybody in America is still required to have health care coverage as of January 1st employers are still required to offer it or they won't pay a penalty this year but they'll pay a penalty um, going forward a year from now Medicaid expansion is still taking place and the biggest change the exchanges are still opening October 1st So there's a big employee communications effort um, that you guys are going to need to undertake So that you don't have employees going 
hey, I think I'll go check out these exchanges and see what they have, you know, as opposed to just taking their own benefits and, and understanding what they, they currently have and not thinking that there's necessarily something better on the exchanges. Um, you know, we've met with hundreds of employers over the past six months, six to eight months, and, um, you know, we've heard everything from, hey, well, I can go to the exchange and get health care for free, right? Um, no, it's not free. Um, or, you know, I've heard the exchanges, it's going to be like $15,000 for an individual to get, to get coverage. And uh, there's a wide range of information out there. A lot of it is, is not accurate information. Um, you know, a lot of this is still kind of a wait and see thing. Um, but today we're going to kind of go through, um, from an EY perspective, what we think employers need to be thinking of to actually operationalize this, actually put this into, into action for your company. So, let's see, skip ahead to um, page seven. So we do have this one year transition period. Um, and really what, in our, our perspective on it is, this is a good trial run. You have a year to kind of make sure you have the right processes, the right systems in place. You're communicating with employees. Um, you're ready when these penalties and these filings are gonna be required in 2015. To, to go, you're good, you're good to go. Um, so really, you know, the delay is a good, good thing. We've seen a lot of employers who've said, oh, pff, all right, good, then I'm not thinking about it again for another year. Mm -hmm. But in our opinion, I think go ahead, take the steps necessary, start doing, you know, trials of stuff, um, figuring out where you need to get the data for the filings, understanding who's gonna own certain processes. The exchange notification process is a big one. How is that going to work? Who's going to own it in your organization? How are you going to respond? Um, really kind of figuring all that out this year before it becomes a reality next year. Okay. Um, so we kind of went over key dates. Um, so the exchanges, again, that's a huge, um, huge, huge change. And this map basically shows you who is going to have state exchanges, who's going to have federal exchanges, and then who's going to have partner, ex partner exchanges, so it's, it's a combination of state and federal efforts. Um, Texas, of course, is going to be a federally uh, facilitated exchange, so the federal government will be running uh, this, the exchange for the state of Texas. Um, you know, really, again, we're already seeing the ads. I'm sure you guys are seeing the ads. You know, it, it's a market share game at this point. So we have 40 million uninsured Americans, and all of those insurance companies want their piece of them. Um, so we're seeing ads in Dallas, we're seeing, you know, hey, come, you know, come buy your insurance from us, you're getting stuff in the mail, um, and your employees are getting all of this. And so it's really important to kind of get out ahead of that because the, the uh, mandatory communication doesn't have to go out till October 1st either. And so, you know, to kind of eliminate hassle on your end, really communicating with your employees now and having them understand hey, you are offered benefits, they're affordable, you know, they meet the minimum value uh, requirement, you know, you don't need to go to an exchange. Um, really kind of helping them understand what they have versus what, what the exchange can provide. Um, the other thing that's big that's happening um, this year is the Medicaid expansion. So they're actually expanding the, the, uh, the definition for Medicaid who can, who's eligible. Um, Texas is one that is not expanding. Um, you know, the, the Medicaid population is huge. Um, there was a statistic, and I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, but hopefully Tanner can remember better than I did. But there, of the percentage of the population that's eligible for Medicaid, it is a tiny, tiny percentage that actually takes it. And so, I'm not going to throw a number out because I'm sure it'll be wrong, but it's, it, it's a very small number. So you have, you know, of that uninsured population that's out there, you know, a lot of those people could probably go on Medicaid, and particularly, you know, in states where they're expanding it, even more people will be eligible. All right, I will turn it over to Tanner, and he'll kind of go through um, kind of the act itself and, and some of the basics around it that you guys um, should be aware of, and I'm sure this is, a lot of this is gonna be old hat for you, but please ask questions as we go. We're, you know, we're here to help you understand this and kind of understand our perspective on it, too. Um, so, as Deanna mentioned, um, at part of this law, uh, what was implemented were a lot of requirements for employers. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today applies to large employers. 
which I will get into a little bit later of kind of what that entails. But there are also certain provisions for small employers as well. So maybe just a show of hands just so I know the audience of uh, how many people here are from organizations that are, have 50 employees or less? Okay, so everybody else is from an organization that's a, a little bit bigger. So the, the large employer provisions you'll, will apply to you and then we'll, for you people from small organizations as well, there, there's some certain rules that you need to be aware of. Um, so I'll get into both. So um, the, the basic employer coverage rules, so as Dana mentioned, one of, uh, basically the, the whole gist of the act is that everybody, you, me, Dana, everybody has to have insurance coverage this year or you pay a $95 penalty on your 1040, you pay a tax. Um, as part of getting everyone to have health insurance, part of that is the, what they call the employer mandate. So most people get health insurance through their employer and so the government had, realizes that and has expanded certain provisions and coverage requirements for employers. Um, so basically the, the general rule is that large employers may be subject to an excise tax if at least one of their full-time employees whose household income is between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level receives a premium tax credit for exchange coverage and an employer either fails to offer coverage to their full-time employees and their dependents or they offer coverage to full-time employees and it, there's, it doesn't meet the affordability or minimum value requirements. So there, it's kind of a, a two-pronged test and, and there's a couple different taxes that apply. Um, and, and we'll get into kind of the federal poverty level and, and what the premium tax credit is, but the gist of the law is basically the government realizes that certain people aren't going to be able to afford coverage and so if you make a certain amount of money, they're going to help you out with the tax credit. And so the employer provisions kind of tie to that aspect. So the, the first question, and so as I mentioned here, the basic rule applies to large employers. So what is a large employer? As I mentioned, it generally is any employer with 50 or more full-time equivalent employees. Um, and this, it, it's a little bit more technical than that. It applies to all common law employers. So. Um, you could potentially be employing certain independent contractors, but if, if the IRS comes in and says, actually, under the common law standard, it looks like this is an employee of yours, then that would be considered an, an employee for purposes of this law. So that, that's an, a, almost a separate and distinct issue that I think Dana mentioned. We have another year to get ready for this, that you want to start looking at um, independent contractors, looking at policies and procedures, who, who your people are. You really want to have a good kind of thumb on your pulse of who your employees are. Um, for foreign companies, if you have, um, and I'm not sure if that applies here, but if you have 50 full-time equivalent employees performing work in the U.S., you are also subject to the law if they have U.S. source income. So if, if you're issuing W-2s to these individuals, then, then you're going to be subject. Um, to determine kind of if you're a large employer, so if, if you come from an organization and you're right on the cusp, you say, I, I, I think we've got 53 people, I don't know if they're full-time, full-time equivalents, so um, it, you basically need to start, it's an hours counting exercise. So a, a full-time employee for purposes of this law is someone who works 30 or more hours a week. Um, and, and let me just say from the front, we, we have very detailed slides here. We only have an hour. So if you want the slides at the end of the day, we can send them to you, but I, I am probably going to gloss over some of the mechanical aspects of how to determine large employer status. I mean, this kind of gets into, you're going to count the number of full-time employees, you're going to calculate the number of full-time equivalents, so that these are people that um, basically you aggregate the number of hours of individuals. So you could have 100 part-time employees, but if, if all of their hours add up to what is known as a full-time equivalent, you could still potentially be subject to the large employer rules. Um, and I think, actually, this was one of the, the initial things in the law when it came out that people went, oh, full-time is now defined as 30 hours, not 40 hours. And a lot of the, the companies we've talked to are like, well, we defined it as 35 or 38 or 36. You know, but now you, you have those additional people that are going to get captured in that 30 hours. Yeah. They will not. So I, I think what 
in my example that I was mentioning, you, if you had 100 people that were potentially working less than 30 hours, you could potentially have more than 50 full-time employees and be considered a large employer. But because you actually don't have any full-time employees, there'd be no coverage, there'd be no corresponding coverage requirement. But if you had one, if you had one guy over here that's working 40 hours, you would have to offer coverage to him because you're a large employer. Does, does that make sense? Correct. That's right. Sure. You don't count the bonds, you count the hours. Correct. Right. That's yes. Right. And then you would be subject to large employer. Potentially, if those full time equivalents yeah. and full time employees added up and aggregated is greater than 50. And you would have to offer those under 30 hours? Insurance? You would only have to offer it to your full time employees. Full -time. Right. That just determines how you're. Yeah, right. it just determines, exactly. it's exactly. almost a two-step process, yeah. so it's a split. Like, large. am I a large employer or am I a small employer? It, yes, I'm a large employer, so now I'm subject to these rules and have to offer coverage to anybody over 30. So if you're a large employer and you don't want to pay for the benefits of the employees now that earn, I mean, are working 30 to 35 hours, mm -hmm. can you drop them? Because I'm hearing people are being dropped 25 hours per week so that the employer doesn't have to pay insurance. You can. Yeah, that, that's a strategy. That, that is a strategy, and we, we are seeing companies that are doing that. And, and I mean, again, that, that goes to a business decision. Is that, is that sustainable? Uh, it's an employee relations issue, or it, are your employees going to be able to live on 25 hours a week? I mean, there's certain, so there's a lot of considerations there. There's but no that, penalty or anything. No. 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 And, you know, in all of the meetings we have, I've only heard of one organization on the West Coast, it's a large retailer, that said, I'm cutting everybody back to 20 hours, and I'm not offering benefits, period. So, and and that, that was their decision, that was right. their business decision. And then, I mean, it obviously becomes a competitive issue, too, right? right? If I'm not going to get benefits, am I going to work for you? Sure, so, right. Right. But yeah, it is a strategy. Are there going to be any kind of tracking software systems for this? Because mm -hmm. there's just myself in HR, and it's very time consuming. Oh, yeah. When the, we start getting all these timesheets, we have to calculate to see who all's worked 30 hours. Absolutely. There are, I, I know a lot of the, probably the big payroll providers are offering these services. I, I don't know about some of the mid-tier and smaller tier providers, but I, I know there are software programs out there that so track employees. With your email address, I could. Yeah. I, I know we have payroll people. And we, yeah, absolutely. Anybody? Is, does that make sense? Sure. Another question. Is, is there, if you have overseas operations as well, so say here locally uh, within the U.S., you have less than 50, but overseas, maybe another 50 on top of that. Will that count towards the overall account? It only counts if they are receiving U.S. source income. So if you issue those people a W-2, or if they're, if they're solely in France and they get French wages and don't have anything to do with the United States, then no. They'd have to yeah, there'd be a lot of an yeah, there'd be a lot of analysis that would go into whether or not yeah. they would be receiving U.S. source income, but that's that's the general answer. But the U.S. citizenship <clears throat> would or would not matter. I, I think it matters in in whether or not somebody is subject to U.S. source income. Right. Let's just say they're not U.S. citizens. Then then, so then they likely are not receiving a W two. They're not getting U.S. source income. Then they're not. A, you don't look at them. Okay. Well, one point of clarification: If you it was on your previous slide. If you're a large employee, you have a qualified health care plan, you offer it to your full-time employees, and they still go to the exchange, are you called harmless? You're fine. All you have to do is offer. As, and that coverage has to be affordable and meet the right. minimum plan value test. It's qualified. It meets those yep. standards. Yep. Okay. yep. Yep. If I could just ask, we you ask questions, if you could project a little bit, because we don't have a microphone for this room, so thanks very much. There is an exception um, that for seasonal employees. Um, so it, this applies to certain retailers or certain agricultural type um, companies. Um, if your workforce exceeds 50 full-time employees for a certain part of the year that's four months or less, you can potentially not be considered a large employer. So some retailers pick up their employees at, right around the holidays, right, to account for all the excess volume. 
if it's only for four months or less, you can exclude those employees to the extent they are truly seasonal employees and back them out and then do your count and, then, and that may save you from actually being a large employer. Um, and, and there's certain guidance that we're actually still waiting on with respect to what a seasonal worker is. Um, it's really, the DOL said it's a reasonable good faith interpretation. And as we go through this, there are a lot of things that are still awaiting guidance, so. Yes. Things could still change. Um, what one item of note in determining large employer, um, this applies on a controlled group basis. And, and so um, I'm not sure how many of you sponsor like a qualified retirement plan, a 401k or a, a pension. These are the same rules that apply for your qualified retirement plan. So you have certain coverage requirements that you have to cover everyone in your controlled group. So if you have a subsidiary, that's included in your count for employers, or excuse me, employees. Um, so you have to look across your, your whole organization on a controlled group basis to determine whether or not you have 50 employees. So you can't say, well, I've got 25 here, but I've got two subsidiaries that each have 15. All three of us are small employers. Actually, you have to aggregate it and say, no, we have 55 employees total and we're a large employer. So what is a full-time employee? You'd think it'd be pretty apparent, but the IRS always makes things hard, and so you have to actually, there's a definition for that. So it's anyone who, on average, has 30 hours per week per month, or 130 hours over a calendar month. And an hour of service not only includes an hour of service, but it includes hours when you're not working. So vacation, leave, holiday, uh, jury duty, military duty, those types of things. Again, I, and, and I will probably keep harping back to this, but it's very similar to your qualified plan rules. A lot of the principles for this law kind of came out of qualified retirement plans, so it's, it's similar when you're counting hours for your qualified plans that you have to include vacation, you have to include jury duty and, and certain things like that. Um, there's a couple ways that you can actually calculate the hours. For hours, hourly employees, you have to count hours. There, there's no way around it. You have to actually receive timesheets and or track it using some sort of software and understand how many hours people are working. For your non-hourly or your salaried employees, you, there's three different ways you can do it. You can you can have them submit timesheets as well, which I, I don't think we see very often, um, and actually count hours. Or you can use an equivalency method. So basically, the the equivalencies there's a days worked equivalency and a week's worked equivalency. The, the days worked is basically you have to credit someone eight hours of service on any day that they're, they have one hour of service. So if I come in for an hour on Tuesday, I might have to be credited eight hours for that day. Um, the, the week's worked is very similar. If I have one hour on Monday, I'm gonna get 40 hours for that week. So it's, it, it's a very, it, it's a generous type of equivalency because the IRS wants to make sure you're not understating hours and, and people are not erroneously being excluded. Um, again, it's very similar to a qualified plan. The DOL has equivalency rules that are actually more generous than this, um, but, but it's a similar type of um, principle. So there are certain um, safe harbors. So, and, and let me go back really quick. Um, Basically, the, the general rule on people who are classified to be full-time, they must be eligible for your health plan um, within 90 days. So you can have a waiting period, but it cannot be longer than 90 days. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. If you have an employee, I'm glad you asked that because you keyed up my next conversation. So the, in, in order to count hours, how do you do that? The, the Treasury has provided a, what they call a measurement and a stability period, safe harbor. So you can basically select a period of time in which you count the hours. So that can be from six months up to a year prior and you basically look at the individual's hours over that period 
and if it comes out to more than 30 hours during that period, then the individual is a um, full-time employee. Um, as, far as, as far as your specific question on whether it's 100, whether you can use the 130 versus 30 hours per week, I'm actually not sure about yeah, that. I'm not sure about that either. Um, we'll note that and see if, uh, see if I can track that down. I, well, let's think about that. So it would be 30 times. I, I, think, I think the 130 is almost a safe harbor type of rule, um, but, I, but I don't know specifically. It, but I think when you get into the calculation, um, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to look at that. Um, and, and so, again, the measurement period you can um, have between 3, 6, 9, 12 months, um, and, and then you have, if you use a measurement period of 6 months of counting hours, you have to offer what they know, what is known as a stability period. So you, this is to prevent people from your example right there. If, hey, I'm 30 hours this week. Now I'm not. I'm in and out of the health plan. You don't. Nobody wants that. So basically, you have to offer coverage for the at least as long as your measurement period was. So if you had a measurement period of six months, you're counting hours for six months, and I'm over 30 hours, the individual has to be allowed to be in the plan for the next six months, at least the same amount of period of time as your measurement period. If my measurement period is a year, then I have to stability period is a year as well. So they have they'll be in a year. I, I think a lot of employees are choosing a year just because it, it'll run on a calendar basis. It's what you're used to. You have an annual open enrollment, so you could count hours around the fall, have your open enrollment October, November, and say, yep, you were over 30 starting January 1. You're going to be eligible for the health plan through 1231, and then we'll do it all over again the next year. So th that is the general kind of full-time employee and counting and, and who needs to be included. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the small employer provisions. Um, the, the general kind of idea is that small employers are not subject to the same tax penalties that large employers are. So if, you're under, if you do all this analysis, you realize you're under 50 employees, you're not going to be hit with an excise tax if you potentially don't offer coverage that's minimum value or you don't offer it to everybody. There are certain provisions under the Affordable Care Act that you need to be aware of. Um, that, uh, there, there is a, what they're calling a shop exchange, which is if you have between 50 and 100 employees, you can actually go through a special exchange for small employers and offer your coverage through there. So I, I think the government kind of realizes that this is a, a very large administrative burden for smaller companies, and so they're kind of helping out a little bit by saying, hey, you can offer coverage through our exchange and we'll, we'll cover some of the admin, the administrative items um, for you in offering that coverage. There is a small employer tax credit. Um, if you're less than 25 and, and there's certain wage requirements, so if your average wages are no more than 50,000, um, there's certain credits that you can apply for. So I'm not gonna get into excruciating detail on that, but just know that there is a, there is an, uh, a credit out there for certain small employers. Um, and, and then some of the other requirements, so you, you still, uh, small employers cannot offer, or cannot price their coverage based on the health of employee population. Um, so, so that's one of the things that's kind of across the board on the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then essential health benefits, so if you're in the small group or individual market, you have to cover um, what, what, what they're calling essential health benefits. Uh, part-time employees, so as I mentioned earlier, large employers are not required to offer coverage to part-time employees. So if I work le if I do my measurement period, it determined that I worked on average less than 30 or 130 a month over that period, then I'm not, I, I'm not going to be offered coverage, offered coverage by the employer and that's fine. Um, if you do decide to say, hey, we've always offered coverage to anybody that's 25 hours or more, there are certain rules. You can't, you can't kind of give them crappy coverage because they're part-time employees. So the, the waiting period still, uh, still applies. Um, certain insurance market reforms apply. There's uh, preventative care. There's no annual and lifetime limits. So a lot of the overall ACA principles still apply if you're going to offer coverage to part-time employees. I, I think they wanted to make sure that part-time employees were not getting kind of a raw deal. 
So what happens if we screw it up or if we don't do this or decide not to comply with this? Um, as Dana mentioned at the front, we view this as a tax law. This is do this or we're going to hit you with an excise tax. So really that's kind of the, the whole pay or play type thing and, and why companies are going to um, comply with this. And again, for next year, nothing's going to happen right. if you don't comply. There won't be any tax penalty. But starting in 2015 is when it, it's going to go into effect. And I think she raised a good point at the beginning is that you really have been given a mulligan here and, and some companies are waiting and saying, hey, we'll, we'll mess with this next year. But all of the companies that we met with, it was everybody seemed to be scrambling because for years nobody thought this was going to actually come into place. There was, uh, oh, well, Romney's going to win the election and overturn it. Oh, well, you know what? The Supreme Court's going to overturn it. And it, it finally passed. Everybody said, oh, shoot, it's going to come into play now and we don't have enough time to implement this and, and people were really scrambling. So now you've kind of been given an extra 12 months and I think it's, it's good to start looking at processes, looking at software and saying, can we, can we count employees? Looking at independent contractors and saying, who, who are our employees? So I, I think there's some key things that need to be done probably starting now in, in, to understand whether or not you're going to be able to comply. Um, so basically, employers will face taxes. There's a new code section um, in the Internal Revenue Code 4980H, which really governs a lot of this. And as I mentioned at the front, um, if you do not offer minimum essential coverage, or if your coverage is unaffordable or not of minimum value, and one of somebody that's eligible for a credit goes out to the exchange and gets a credit, then you're going to be deemed. Um, and, and I'll get into a, a little bit more specifics of where, around what those penalties are. And then that last bullet, like we said, there's a transition period for the penalties for 2014, and they won't apply in, until 2015. Yeah. But again, all of this hinges on someone going to the exchange and getting that tax credit. Yep. Any questions at, at this point? Right. I'm sorry? If you're a large employer. If you are a large right. employer, right. yes. So, for less than 50, keep on the way we go. Yes, subject to kind of what I mentioned that there's certain the small employers, yes. certain principles of around you can't kind of discriminate on health, um, annual and lifetime limit. I mean, there's certain things for small so employers that have to look at what we're offering and tweak it a little bit. Yes, right. And then just continue to offer it to Correct. our full-time employees the way we're doing. Yes, right. Yep. Okay, cool. This is all independent contractors. What are you talking about? In your employee <clears throat> so um, the, the IRS has said in the, in the regulations under health care reform that they're going to look at the common law rules of who an employer is. And, and what that means is the IRS has what's known as a right to control test. So you may say that someone is an independent contractor. You may have a contract with them. And it may say, I get paid on a 1099, I, I am not an employee of you, I don't offer benefits. The IRS may come in and say, well, actually, even though you say that, there's 20 factors that we look at that says differently. It says that you have the right to control this person, this person's been there for five years, What's the, there's no real difference between an employee and this individual. So it, even though you say that, the IRS may think otherwise and that could create potentially certain issues. So if, let's say you have 45 employees and 20 contractors. The IRS comes in down the road a couple years from now and says, actually, 10 of these contractors appear to be employees, and now not only are you liable for back FICA and, and employer kind of taxes that you should have been withholding because this person's actually an employee, well now, oh, whoops, now you're at 55 employees and you're a large employer and you haven't been offering coverage. So we, we don't know how this is going to play out, but it definitely is a, a, a consideration to start looking at your population and understanding, well, maybe this person is an employee and we should actually make them an employee and start paying them on a W-2 and, and withholding employment taxes and certain things like that. So I think this year is a good time to understand your policies and procedures around that and understand if you're complying. And these are our more, these are your people like, I'm hiring Tanner to come in and do something versus I'm going through an agency and they're providing Tanner to me. So 
I, you know, Tanner comes in. We see this a lot, um, actually a lot in the IT arena. A lot of those, you know, your IT people are independent contractors, but they have badges to get in your, in your building. They have access to all your systems. They have an email with your email address, uh, you know, on it. I mean, all of that stuff really points to, oh, they're functioning as an employee, not an independent contractor. And so particularly if you're kind of in, you know, on that cusp, of, you know, maybe I'm right at the 50 mark, you really have to be aware of that because if the IRS comes in and, and looks at this, like Tanner said, and does their 20-factor test and says, yeah, these extra 10 people are really employees, then, you know, you could be subject to additional penalties because you weren't offering, um, offering coverage. But if you're already a large employer, you already have more than 50 employees, what I'm trying to figure out is do you have to offer health care coverage for those? So, so the issue you'll face there, and I'll get into this, it's, it's actually on this slide, is the, the what we call the A penalty, where you have to offer coverage to substantially all your full-time employees. It ends up being a 95% threshold. And if for some reason you had a lot of independent contractors that you were not offering coverage to, but the IRS says, nope, these are employees, all of a sudden you thought you were offering coverage to all your employees, but you may not be, and you may fall below that 95%, and now all of a sudden you're potentially hit with an excise right. tax penalty. So now you're deemed to have not offered coverage to 95% plus of your full-time employees, and that, that's the big that's penalty. That's the big one, yep. So that's $2,000 times every employee, every full-time employee, and you get to subtract out the first 30. But, that I mean, that's the big penalty because they deem you as you didn't offer coverage. Um, and, you know, we had a, a client in Houston, um, and Tanner actually worked a lot with them, but almost half of their workforce was independent contractors who a lot of them were functioning in an employee capacity. And so, you know, they really needed to look at that and, you know, either ch kind of change their arrangement with those people if they don't want to bring them on as full-time employees or bring them on as full-time employees. And, and one more point, and then I'll get to your question. I think, uh, the again, I will say we don't know how this is going to play out. The IRS has not issued regulations or guidance on how they're going to enforce this, but from what we've seen, with employer or with the service, the DOL and certain litigation, and there's even a White House initiative. This is a hot button issue that the, the regulatory bodies are focusing on big time. They're focusing on back taxes, and, and we all know they're struggling to pay for this law. So I, I would not be surprised to see them coming in on piggybacking on an in, independent contractor review and, and applying the ACA penalties as well, because it's a money grab. I mean, it's low hanging fruit that potentially it could, could result in large revenues for the government. So we just need to be really, really sure that those that are classed as independent contractors <clears throat> meet the test. Right. Yes. Right. But keep in mind, this all hinges on someone goes to the exchange and gets a tax credit. Yeah. That has to happen before any of this other stuff comes into play. Yep. So you and then. You think it's conceivable for those that still have a the company has a law that comes with the There's a lot that they'll look at. It's not necessarily just the time. I mean, from what you're telling me, it sounds like they tr that it truly are kind of contractors. You're contracted out to do your landscaping. But again, I think it is important for companies to, to look at things like that. Uh, understand, hey, uh, are we doing this right? So, it, it, I mean, it sounds like it's fine, but you want to really get into the details and make sure you're, you feel comfortable with that. You mentioned So, so the IRS had actually just it recently issued guidance that basically if they are offered coverage through their agency, then you're fine. But it's going to be on you to look at that contract. Are you going to say to your agency, hey, what, what if you're not offering coverage and I get dinged for a penalty? Are you going to indemnify me for that? So there's certain things that you want to work out with your agency to make sure that you're, you're covered in case that they're not doing what they say they do. Or, or maybe it's you get a, a, a representation letter from the agency that says, yeah, we are offering coverage in this. We've had an independent firm come in and say it meets its minimum value. It, it is affordable. 
Um, we're offering it to everyone, and, and to the extent this is wrong, we'll, we'll, we'll pay the penalty. So I, I think there's considerations on that side as well. Sure. How does this law affect uh, self-funded as opposed to open insurance plans? It affects them the same for the most part. I think the only difference that we've seen so far is there was a uh, PCORI filing that was due this past July 31st. So this is, the, this is, again, a way to fund part of this law. It's called the Patient-Centered Outcome Resources, Research, Research Institute. Institute. So this is um, a, a program that the government's putting in for, for health research, I think. Um, Self-funded plans had to file that on their own, fully insured. The insurer filed that penalty, or uh, that excise tax filing. Uh, yeah. filing. Yeah, that's really the primary difference um, in fully insured versus self-funded is who who's responsible for the filings and paying like the PCORI fee and the reinsurance fee. And, and then, I mean, you're obviously, if you're a self-insured, you're on the hook for making sure your own plan design works right. I mean, generally, if you're fully insured, your insurer is going to offer you some, I mean, they're not going to offer you a product that is not, not compliant. compliant. Yeah. So it, it's more just on you to make sure that what you're offering meets your minimum value, is affordable. Then, then yeah. I then I don't yeah. think there would be a difference if you're if you're kind of having that outsourced. Yeah. Okay, we only have um, a little bit less than fifteen minutes. Yeah, so let me so we'll let me do a high level of just kind of the penalties. So there there's two penalties under forty nine eighty H. There's what what we're called the A penalty because it's subsection A of that, and this is the big one where if the large employer does not offer minimum essential coverage to full time employees, so thirty hours again, and their dependents, you may face a tax of. $2,000 multiplied by your total full-time employee population if one of those employees goes and gets a credit. So as Dana mentioned, this is all hinges on the fact that I have somebody that's working for me that's making 100 to 400% of the poverty line. They decide they don't want coverage with me. They go out to the exchange and get a, a tax credit and are approved. If that happens, then all of a sudden I've kind of passed through the excise tax gate and now I'm, can potentially be subject to it if I'm not offering coverage. And, and when we say full-time employees, again, there, there's kind of a, um, a the, the IRS wanted to prevent the fact that you get dinged for this if there's a foot fault. So there's a 95% threshold. So you have to offer it to 95% of your employees. Um, well, and, and one thing to keep in mind, you know, poverty level, you think, oh, that's really low and I don't pay any of my employees that, that low. But it's one to four times, which actually ends up being forty-four thousand dollars or something like that. So that's not, you know, that's good wages. That that's still going to put them in that air, that category of being eligible for a tax credit. So what you're saying is we have to offer benefits to the dependents of the full-time employees as well, correct? Correct. Right now, dependents does not include spouse. It's not right. So actually, UPS was, was in the news a couple weeks ago because they said, if your spouse can get coverage through, some, through their employer, we're not covering them. They're off. They're not, they can't, they're not eligible for our plan. And that, that was estimated to save them like $40 million a year or something. What if your spouse doesn't work? Then they're going to have to... Then you, they can, yeah. They're eligible for UPS's plan. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if the spouse can get coverage through their employer, then UPS was saying they can't be on our plan. And just to kind of hammer home Dana's point, um, and this is a little hard to see, I know, but at the bottom two rows, the federal federal poverty line safe harbor for this year was 100% was 11.5, but up to 400% is 45, almost $46,000. So if I'm making it, if I'm making 45,000 salary, I'm potentially eligible for a premium tax credit. So it's it's not super lower paid people as you might think. They're are a lot of people that are going to be eligible for this. And then let me get into the B tax. Um, so this is basically if your coverage, you, you, you offer the coverage, again, if somebody goes and gets a premium tax credit, but the coverage is for some reason unaffordable or it does not provide minimum value, then the employer may face a tax of $3,000 multiplied by the number of full-time employees receiving the premium tax credit, or $2,000 times the number of full-time employees, whichever is um, less. So uh, again, this, this is hinged on the fact of who's getting a premium tax credit. Okay. I didn't know if you had a question. And so again, I'm, I don't know if they've covered this 
in sessions earlier today, but the affordability and the minimum value standards, have, do you guys, are you all familiar with that? Or we can go over that pretty quickly. If yeah, you I, can, I can run. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So affordability is basically the employee's share of a self only, so no dependents, no um, spouses, premium for the employer's lowest cost plan cannot exceed 9.5% of household income. Um, or the employee may be eligible for a tax credit. So a lot of employers are saying, well, we have no idea what household income is. I mean, somebody's spouse may be CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but we're paying them $10,000. We, we don't know. So there are certain safe harbors that you can rely on that companies will have access to. So there's a, a W-2 safe harbor. So basically, you know what you're paying employees, you know what you're reporting in box one of a W-2. As long as the employee premium does not exceed 9.5% of what's reported in box one, then it can be considered affordable. Um, there's a rate of pay safe harbor, so the employee premium share cannot exceed 9.5% of basically the hourly rate of pay that you're paying. And there, there's certain kind of mechanical way to calculate that. I think you use 130 hours per month, again, um, and, and then there's a federal poverty line safe harbor. So if your premiums do not exceed 9.5% of the federal poverty line, then the coverage can be, will be considered affordable. And, and again, here's the slide kind of on the affordability. The, these are some of the estimates. And like I said, there's a lot of detail here. So if you do want to see these slides, let us know and we can send these out. Um, Self only, yeah. Yep. Correct. Yep. Um, minimum value is a, a plan basically is not of minimum value, doesn't provide minimum value if the plan's share of the total allowed cost of benefits provided under the plan is less than 60% of such cost. Um, and, and this is generally an actuarial type analysis that's done to look at everyone and, and understand whether or not the company is providing 60% or more of the benefits. So there's a certain cost sharing arrangement that has to be done in order to meet minimum value. So you can't, basically can't just make the employees pay for everything. The employer is gonna to have to cover part of it or else it's not gonna be considered minimum value. Yeah. In our uh, health coverage for our employees in our county, we have the basic uh, healthcare insurance Colds, cancer, everything else. And then we have a, another sign up day where we sign up for optional coverages, which the employees pay for. We pick up all the premiums on the basis. Then we have the optional day for uh, dental and eye care and all the rest. In this, will those two things be combined to, to arrive at that nine and a half? Or is that nine and a half? Does that just apply to the basic type of health care and not include dental care, eye care, and all the rest? It, it just applies to the basic. Yeah. It, it yeah. wouldn't be any yeah. sort of supplemental, right? Yeah. Assuming so, your basic meets the other requirements. So in fact, for the total insurance package, our employees, our employees somewhere could be paying up to 9.5% of their gross pay plus major part that they pay on all this optional stuff. So the so their total insurance uh, premium in their paycheck could, could get to be a truly significant number. Is that yeah. I could, yeah. Yes. Yep. So I, I think that at a high level those are kind of the taxes. Um, I will that there are um, certain communications with employees in the IRS and we've kind of laid out the steps of how it'll work. So one thing to be aware of is um, basically the employers under the Federal Labor Standards Act will, must provide employees with information about coverage and availability of the exchanges by 10-1. So that's kind of a compliance deadline that you need to be aware of that these notices need to go out by October 1st. And, and this is kind of, in my opinion, kind of tricky timing because if you're on a calendar year benefit plan, you don't have open enrollment until probably November sometime. So your employees are now getting these notices October 1st, they're seeing all these ads for the exchanges, they're hearing all this stuff about the exchanges, but they don't actually, they aren't getting their benefits information necessarily or the ability to enroll and change their benefits 
for another you know month to six weeks. So, you know, kind of that timing is is going to leave some some questions in employees' minds. And okay, well, what is better for me? What do I have now? I mean, I know. If if I just think about myself, I mean, I don't think about my benefits unless I need to go to the doctor or it's open, open enrollment. I mean, other than that, I don't really give it a lot of thought. Um, so, you know, and if I'm just a normal employee, if I'm not at, out at conferences talking about this, I don't really get this. I mean, this is a very complicated law. I think, you know, they're just going to see the ads. They're going to hear stuff from their friends. They're, you know, and it's going to be like, okay, what do I do? Can I go to the exchange and get it for free? Maybe I can. I don't know. Maybe I need to check that out. What, you know? I mean, I just think it's it's a critical time to really start communicating with your employees and making sure they know the value of the benefits that you're offering and the, the cost that they're incurring for that, you know, versus what they could potentially get on the exchange. So in summary. Yes. So in summary, there's a lot here. <laughs> there is. There's a ton here. <laughs> It's uh, the reason you're here all day is because there's a lot of aspects of this law. There's, there's a lot of things employers need to be aware of. Um, and start looking at your plans. I think the key takeaway is the, the one year delay is not only a blessing from a, just an administrative standpoint, but really to, to start getting your ducks in a row. I think we, we have no doubt this is going to go into effect at some point or another. And really, it, it kind of behooves employers to start looking at these items and, and start kind of making sure everything is going to be in compliance. All right. Are you both staying through lunch? Yes. Yes. So uh, Jane and Tana will be here. Get their contact information. They'll be around. I'm sure they'll be happy to speak with you. This sounds like we could have done this for two or three hours. Uh, on behalf of uh, the chamber, uh, Dana and Tana, we'd like to present you with uh, Bill George's book, True North. He's a uh, professor of uh, business, uh, Harvard Business School. Oh, great. This book's been uh, noted by uh, New York Times, one of the most important business books on leadership. And he also is sort of a hometown boy. He was chairman, CEO of Medtronic Corporation okay. for a number of years. Okay. Great. So we really thank your time this morning. Join me in our welcome.